everyone, and welcome to this special segment of The Cube. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. Today, we're going to be honing in on a new key partnership between Ivanti and its ecosystem that is addressing some of the most pressing challenges that security teams and technology teams are facing today. I have two great guests for this segment. I'd like you to welcome Srinivas Mukamala. He is the Chief Product Officer at Ivanti, and Kiran Chinagangana Gari. He is the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Secure, and thank you both for coming on the Cube. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a thank pleasure, you, Rebecca. So we are going to be I mean, mitigating cyber risk is a top priority for organizations today, and it's it's a really big challenge because there's a lot of headwinds. First of all, we have shortages in security talent. Uh, there are constrained IT budgets, which is putting a lot of constraints on how well enterprises are able to defend against these threats. Uh, a joint report that you both put out in March of 2023, the total number of breaches reported was higher than the previous three years combined. That is a, a, a scary and staggering statistic. We know that Congress is passing legislation, the White House is putting out executive orders, governments around the world are, 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 are really focusing on these issues. Against this backdrop, you have announced this partnership I'd love for you to start, tell me what we need to know. What is, what is new here? Um, Sri, I'm gonna start with you. Tell us a little bit about this partnership. Absolutely, Rebecca, you hit it straight on, right? If you take a look at what's happening, we are catching up to what we call asymmetric warfare. Most of us understand what asymmetric war is, conventional war, right? You take tanks, I take tanks, I take my ground troops, I take my ground troops. What happened in the last three years especially is we're seeing a hidden enemy. We don't know who it is. We don't know where they're going to come from, how they're going to strike us. It is starting to show a massive impact. There are four questions posed by every single organization, irrespective of the size. I mean, this is where the whole equality comes into play. Cybersecurity is becoming the haves and the have-nots. Right, It's boiling down to, do I have the resources? Can I afford cybersecurity? And what are the four fundamental problems every organization is trying to address? You touched on two of them. The first one is, do I have very clear visibility into my risk? That is the number one, it's risk management. We know every single leader, irrespective of the size, focuses on that because you manage risk. Risk is seen as an advantage because companies who take risk are the ones that truly strive in any competing economy. Cyber is actually taken as an advantage if you do it right by the companies who invest in it. At the same time, if you ignore it, you pay the price. The second one is tech is ubiquitous to that. Every company is on a transformation journey. There is no company that is not digitizing. There is no company that is not on a path for digital transformation. There is no company that is not adopting cloud. There is no company that is not talking AI. So when you look at it, there's a massive revolution. I mean, you can talk about, we went through industrial revolution. We went through the communication revolution, that's the internet. We went through the software revolution where everybody adopted software. Now, what we're going through is we're going through a massive, I would say, intelligent revolution. We're trying to empower every human being to give their best. What that means is now you want to understand your technology risk. You have to understand your overall risk. You have to understand your technology risk. Am I adopting the tech that will not create risk down the line? Then you touched on the human talent. Do I have qualified team members to address the risk. Before we address the risk, do we have qualified team members who understand the risk? Do they have the right context? Do they have the right tools? Do they have the right partners to help them prioritize? It comes down to empowering again, enabling and empowering. And finally, the fourth one is, there is no way we can fight AI with humans. There is no way you can fight machines with humans. We have to automate, right? You have to fight AI with AI. You have to fight 
machine speed with operational speed. Unfortunately, we are still way behind in addressing risk posed by machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm speaking purely from a cybersecurity perspective. So if you take a look at the four key outcomes, what people are looking at to address, and this is a problem for everybody. And cybersecurity today is only invested by the people who can afford it. Like you touched on it. Now the legislation forces everyone to invest everyone to adopt, everyone to ensure not only they have resilience, but they're protecting critical data they're collecting from the consumers and the citizens. End of the day, it's protecting us like individuals who we are giving our data to the companies. So it boiled down to, can we assure our data is not misused? And what does it mean? Can we trust the systems can we trust the organizations? Can we trust the governments with our data? It's coming down to a very simple factor of trust. Yes, I'm willing to give you my data, but can I trust you? And so that's where I truly see our partnership very important because end of the day, everything is coming down to two elements, data and context. That's when we felt we do a lot. I mean, as the viewers know, Ivanti is a global company. We touch critical infrastructure across the globe. And we wanna make sure whoever we partner with has the best data and also has the best domain expertise. At the same time, have capabilities where they can apply machine learning and artificial intelligence. So those were our fundamental considerations. We want to be the best, we are the best in what we do, but we also wanna make sure when we partner with startups or with companies, we try to bring the best as well. And the elements we look for is the North Star is always the data. Data with context and expertise gives us what we need. Kieran, I'd love to bring you in here and talk a little bit about it from Securin's perspective. It seems as though providing customers with more visibility into their potential cyber threats and exposures is, is so key here. Absolutely, Rebecca. Again, I echo a lot of what um, Sri just talked about, right? You know, let's make us start with the AI. Generative AI is something that has taken the world by surprise. Like in the last year or so, the use of AI has tremendously grown, right? But a lot of folks are using AI without realizing, like, you know, how this AI generated models, like your foundational LLM models are, you know, being claimed, what data is being used, how your data is going to be used, right? So we want to look at, you know, you know, how, you know, the organizations can leverage the AI in a more meaningful and safe, safe fashion, right? But at the same token, we're also looking at, you know, how adversaries are using AI to promote attacks, promote breaches, right? And do it in a faster, more um, efficient way, right? So, you know, like she said, we have to use AI to tackle AI, right? You know, but at the same token, you know, you don't want to purely rely on AI. You also want to bring in the human element. Right, you know, so that's where the dual use, you know, comes into play. What security brings to the table is what we call as a human augmented machine learning. Because if you can use, you know, humans to understand, you know, how these models can be structured, but you know, also provide inputs to it and be able to make decisions in a more meaningful fashion, that will actually take, you know, uh, much further, right? So that's the first one. Second is, you know, we also look at, you know, how the attackers are using AI, right? You know within you know the different domains right you know again we look at a specific not just from a generalist view right you know but we are looking at you know hey you know this particular ransomware or apt group is you know focusing on industrial sector or manufacturing or finance or healthcare right you know so we're looking at a very different lens and seeing you know what are these you know threat actors doing and how do we actually think like hackers how do we think like these bad actors and how do we bring that into the you know overall you know um you know the product that we are building right this is where um, you know we come into play the secure and vulnerability intelligence product is actually a outcome of extensive research you know through the collaboration of darpa it's a you know, product that, you know, it started off with the funding from DARPA, but also collaboration with Arizona State University, but also our internal teams that have boots on the ground and experience. In fact, some of our staff members are the, you know, authors of the exploits for Blue Keep and Double Pulsar, right? And also have that extensive background. 
Today, to our credit, we have 55 zero days. You know, that's only because we are in the trenches looking at this adversarial behavior. All of this is going to benefit, you know, Ivanti customers. You know, we talked about you know, how do we actually, you know, be in front of the game, right? You know, you know, how do we, you know, look at this war from a very different lens, right? Not only uh, hands, right, but the cyber war, right? You know, this is what we bring to. I want to go back to you and, and ask you about these specific problems that Ivanti and Securin were hoping to address and why vulnerability management is such a challenge for so many companies. So great question, Rebecca. So one of the interesting things what's going on is if you take a look at the legislation that's passed this year, it's called the Vulnerability Reduction Act, right? It requires all federal entities to identify vulnerabilities, prioritize vulnerabilities, and remediate vulnerabilities. If you go back to the SEC, they clearly talked about not incident and breach disclosures, but they want you to now disclose material risk, right? You'll see a lot of chatter on solar winds and a few others, right? You're seeing that in the news now. And when you go back almost 18 months, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, CISA, started a program called Known Exploitable Vulnerabilities. The whole idea there is we're going to look at what vulnerabilities are used by adversaries to advance their motives, right? Breach, cause chaos, cast havoc, and all that stuff. When you start looking at the entire ecosystem, we're too late to this. We've been talking about vulnerabilities for 12, 13 years. What changed is in the last, say, 12 months, what used to be a periodic assessment looking for vulnerabilities has now become continuous. Now, you have to look for vulnerabilities on a continual basis. It is no more a luxury I'm going to scan once a day or once a week or once a quarter or once a year. The frequency at which you're scanning is now continuous, which means you're collecting a lot more data than you ever collected. It's boiling down to a data problem. You're trying to understand the data you're collecting. Data without context is meaningless, right? Vulnerability, there's a precursor to it. It's the weakness that causes the vulnerability. It's the vulnerability that attackers exploit. It's the exploit that causes breaches. While KEVs are focused on what's used to create a breach, that's too late. You want to be proactive. While that's very important, we started as the known known. I know I have a vulnerability. I know there is an exploit. Somebody is doing it. By the way, it started with a handful today, and CISA has not a thousand today. How do I prioritize those thousand when I have thousands of vulnerabilities? I'll give you a simple stat. When you look at the national vulnerability database, you have 200,000 plus vulnerabilities. Out of them, less than 10% are actually weaponized. In other words, somebody took time to write an exploit. Well, is that everything important? Not really. How many of them are actually used and are dangerous? In other words, it doesn't require a human interaction. It's less than 3,000. When you start looking at what's used by ransomware and threat actors, it's down to 300. When you start looking at what's really trending in the last 30 days, it's down to 50 to 100. When you look at that prioritization, you're really solving for a data problem. And this is where when Kiran touched on, we have the domain expertise. If you let the machine do the analysis without the domain expertise, you're getting, going to get garbage in, garbage out. Why do we need epi epidemiologies to look at the data and tell this is a real epidemic? Right? Think about COVID. It's a global problem, but is that a problem in your house? That's why we ship testing kits, remember? And we said, do rapid tests, rapid tests. And that's what I like about what Kiran just talked about. It is real science. It started as a DARPA project out of Arizona State University. And this team was in the front lines of cyber war, 
creating some of the most lethal exploits, right? Blue Keep, every security researcher would know. Double Pulsar, which is WannaCry, we're still, everybody knows, one of the most expanding ransomware. So when you start looking at this whole thing, Rebecca, we need the right data at the right time so we can help our customers prioritize what matters. It boils down to, am I prioritizing for three reasons again? First, am I assuring my consumers, my customers, resilience? I know what I'm doing. I'm ensuring that I'm fixing things at the right time. Two, am I complying with the regulations we just talked about? Three, it's your promise to your customers, right? Hey, when you collect data, we take it very seriously. So what we get from Securin is really not all the comprehensiveness of the data set because NVD today doesn't have the full coverage. They have a 30-day to 45-day lag in getting the information. So we don't want to miss out for 30 days. We don't want to have blind spots. Then being able to know what's going on on the entire internet is a Hercules task. I mean, I need to mine every single thing and figure out what are the needles in the haystack. They give that to us. Not only they help us collect all the hay, assemble the haystack, they also start finding the needles in the haystack. Then when they find the needles, they come back and tell us, this is why this needle is important. These are the five attacker groups. This is their intent. This is what they have done in the past. Oh, by the way, our domain experts actually have validated that that's a real bad thing. A classic example of a human anatomy. X-ray, when you find something, you go ask for a CT scan because you want to get a validation. When you do your CD scan, you might go, I want to go to the lymph nodes all the way. You do your MRIs or vice versa, MRI, CD scan. Then if you really see a problem, you go for a biopsy because you want to go deep and understand how bad it is, right? And if you fail these steps, all you're left with is an autopsy, right? Your autopsy is your breach. You come back, that's your pen test, your biopsy. When you do an authenticated scan, that's your CD and MRI. When you do your external scan, that's your X-ray. So when you start putting it back into your human analogy, that's really what happens. You're collecting more data. X-ray is just a film. CT is much bigger. MRI is much bigger report. When you do the biopsy, it's a much bigger report. So that's really what we like about what Securin gives us. So what we do to our customers is, we don't want them to go spend time on data scientists, on machine learning experts, on security experts. It is the super outcomes we talk about. How do we give you the right actionable information and automate that for you so you can really solve the problems that matter? And that's really how we work on this. And the other thing I also like about what we started doing is, rather than being very tactical about vulnerabilities, we expanded that. What does the vulnerability do? It creates exposure. That's what we're trying to address. And we also touched on continuous. We touched on threat. So we started looking at what would be the right framework, continuous threat exposure management, because there's a weakness, there's a vulnerability, there is an exploit, and how do I address this? So we started putting together an industry framework called CTAM. And given the vast tool chest Ivanti has, from a discovery to patch management, to risk-based vulnerability management, to access management, to device management, now we were able to actually bring all this data together and help our customers understand the exposures. However, from an external internet-facing perspective, again, we reached out to a partner here who has the ability to mine the dark and the deep and the surface to bring that exposure to us. And that's what we have done. Elevated ourselves, not just to vulnerabilities, but to exposures to start helping us get that very clear visibility and use their intelligence, their data, their domain expertise to prioritize what those exposures are to help our customers truly be proactive, not reactive. So, Kieran, it seems as though that security teams need to just truly understand the true risk of the vulnerability 
that's the only way they can start prioritizing remediating it. So how how do they how do they do that? Um, hundred percent, you know, Rebecca. Right. You know, the key is, you know, what you just said. Right. Understanding the risk of the vulnerability. I call it as the dynamically able to track the risk of the vulnerability in its continuum, right? From the time this vulnerability was discovered until that product is sunset, right? You know, there is a continuum and you have to look at this, um, you know, the vulnerability and then the constant risk and threats that are posing, right? So I would give you like five things, right, you know, for your viewers to walk away from. One is coverage, right? Three touched on it, right? NVD has about 200,000 plus CVs. I'll give you an actual number, 225,000 CVs. That's what they track, right? They're missing about, you know, another 65,000, you know, CVs. That's because, you know, NVD is always behind by about, you know, 30 to 45. Days. That's what, you know, Sri alluded to, right? So first is, making sure you have the right coverage. If you don't have the coverage, then your scanners and all of it are not really going to actually identify the small vulnerabilities, right? That's the first one. Second one is, how do you prioritize vulnerabilities? NVD does not have a threat context. When you look at NVD, you know, they take the information from, you know, whoever is reporting the CNAs and all of it, and they actually have analysts, you know, give a score, but they don't have the threat context of, you know, which ransomware, which APT group is using it, right? Is it trending and deep and dark or none of it, right? The other one that, you know, us customers or, you know, some of the vendors use quite a bit is EPSS, you know. Uh, EPSS is really good, but it only goes to the extent of saying that, hey, you know, this vulnerability is likely going to get exploited in the next 30 days. After it gets exploited, first.org and EPSS say that all vulnerabilities should be treated equal and you should prioritize all of them. The challenge with that is, you know, there are about thousand plus, you know, vulnerabilities, you know, CISA KV, right, you know, which is what a lot of folks are now using, just cross, you know, thousand plus vulnerabilities, right? That's still a lot, right? So how do you prioritize those vulnerabilities when you have thousands of them to deal with, right? This is where, you know, Sri was talking about, you know, now you take the funnel approach, like how many have RCEP, remote code execution of privilege escalation, right? How many of them are actually used by ransomware or APT groups? How many are trending, right? Now the funnel will start getting smaller and smaller. If you now add the threat context, right, you know, which of these are on your external attack surface, right, you know, that actually will go down, right, which ones are highly automatable, right, you know, then that list would even go down, right. Now, you actually can take that, map it to the miter and say that, hey, is there a kill chain that we can form and look at the overall, you know, kill chain for this, you know, attack, right, you know, then that list will actually even go down too, right. So, that's the second one. How do you prioritize vulnerabilities based on the threat context? The third one is understanding the supply chain risk, right? One of the use cases is like, you know, as you're building software, how do you view shift left, right? You know, you want to ideally prevent these vulnerabilities from getting into your production code, right? You know, so early detection is really great. So how does a tool or a, you know, a, a vulnerability intelligence you know, product help you is like as developers are writing code, you know, during the pre-commit code, we can look at the package and say, these packages have these specific, you know, vulnerabilities and these vulnerabilities are being exploited by threat actors, right? That actually can give you that heads up so that before that code gets even checked into a source rate control um, solution, or, you know, then you can actually detect it and prevent it. For some reason, you know, if it gets, you know, um, beyond the pre-commit, right, then you still have the different stage gates, right? You know, your CI, CD, and all the other ones, right? You still have some automation built into these various tools, whether it is Jenkins or GitHub or Git, uh, GitLab or any of it, right? You can do workflows over there and still mitigate some of the risk, right? So that's the third use case Emanti customers could benefit from. The fourth one is the prediction, right? You know, um, NVD is definitely behind, right? You know, because you know, not all the vendors will report directly to, you know, the uh, MITRE or, you know, NVD right away, right? So they're definitely behind. That information doesn't get updated, right? The other one is the CSA. CSA, DHS, KVs are definitely behind, too, right? What what we have seen in our analysis when we do the research is we are able to predict about 30 to 45 days ahead of the DHS CISA cases. What does that mean to viewer like or event customer is 
that is the window then now they can actually look at it and say hey i have this 30 to 45 days window let me start patching my lower and minds my dev qa stage in uat whatnot right because you know before it actually gets used by a ransomware group or apt group now you can start putting compensating controls maybe you can patch your systems maybe you can decommission the system if you don't you know want it anymore and there are a lot of things you can see the other thing we're also seeing is you know bug bounty programs is very very ineffective right what we are seeing is is the CVs that these bug bounty programs are prioritizing are not what the actual, you know, real is showing that, you know, the attackers are using CWEs, right, you know, that are not part of the bug bounty program. So that is something that we're seeing that is very ineffectiveness of it. That's the fourth one. And the last one is, you know, how do you be, you know, safe from scanner blind spots? You know, scanner by nature, right, you know, you have to work on a plugin, you have to have a detection script whenever a vulnerability is identified. They are a newly identified number of these discovered, right? You know, we call this as mean time to exposure. How many days you're sitting, you know, without any protection, without a scanner being able to detect it, right? You know, so these are the, you know, the key, you know, measurements that we want to provide to Ivan, the customer saying that, hey, we can help you detect this particular vulnerability, even if a scanner is not able to identify, right? You know, those are four or five, you know, key benefits, you know, from this partnership that Ivanti's, you know, customers could benefit from. So Sri, picking up on Kieran's last point, what are the keys to successfully mapping vulnerabilities to software updates? And how do you ensure that the patches don't dramatically lag the known vulnerabilities and, and that you're also being consistent across, across your platforms and portfolios? Great question, Rebecca. If you take a look at Ivanti, what we're known for, we're known as the world's last mile company. Our mission to the world is we will fight the cyber war, period. To do that, we can't go alone. We have to make sure we play in the ecosystem. So our heritage has been the world's best patch management company. And if you take a look at 90% of the security companies, they report on vulnerabilities. You're really trying to build a big R, which is resilience. I touched on it when we talked about what the government is asking for is resilience. Are we resilient against a cyber attack? It's a question every one of us have to ask ourselves. The promise of resilience is a lot of the security companies today can report on a vulnerability. They can respond to a vulnerability, very few of them can remediate a vulnerability. For resilience, what you need is not a response, not a report, because that's too late. We talked about we have to operate at machine speed and at operational efficiency. So Ivanti started with the last mile of helping other security companies remediate. When you find a vulnerability, use a patch management to remediate. And what we realized almost two years ago was that's not enough because we don't have enough resources, not the time to patch everything. What I liked about our partnership here is, Kiran touched on, hey, we are 60 days ahead, 25 days ahead, 30 days ahead. First blind spots. In patch management, we have to either collect a patch or we need to write a patch, right? Us getting 60 day a heads up is nirvana. Now we are ahead of the game. We are toe-to-toe toe -to -toe with the attacker and we can prioritize patches. So suddenly what we created was risk-based patching. We created a complete category of risk-based patching, patch that matters, the one that can resolve the maximum number of your vulnerabilities to shrink your attack surface. Now you can measure, it's a measurable outcome. It's a true risk reduction. And not only that, you're ahead of the game. So that's what I love about this partnership. It is a very data-centric approach. It is not believe in me, believe in Imhanti. It's our data is the belief system. Our data is the North Star, and that's our promise, right? Secure everywhere work. 
no matter where you are, no matter which computer you're using, no device you're using, we will ensure there is resilience. How do we do that? We want to make sure we understand your attack surface, we prioritize it, and we patch it. It comes back to a complete life cycle. The other thing I also loved about what Kiran just touched on and what you just asked, Rebecca, is it's also giving us a very interesting perspective into how we look at code. What's going on today is machine-generated code, machine-generated software is a reality. You keep hearing about co-pilots. Co-pilots are writing software. Humans are writing only very little code. That's going to be a reality. Machines are going to write a lot of code, and humans will look at it, verify it, and put a little bit of code. What this partnership is doing is trying to understand the weaknesses the attackers are going after. You asked this question to Kiran a little bit. How are your human experts looking at this? The data they're giving us is not only about vulnerabilities, but they're helping us understand what weaknesses are attackers prioritizing so they can find the vulnerabilities and quickly write exploit code. They're going to use machines to do all this now. So we got to go ahead of it. Now, the research and the actual work this partnership is doing is being able to understand the weaknesses. And several of them are missed in the top 25 rankings of the MITRE. These are blind spots. And that's exactly the beauty of this. Again, we're going back by the data. We're not calling anybody, but the data is really telling. We have gaps and we need to address it. And that's the promise this partnership is delivering to our customers. So, Kieran, another aspect of, of all, of all the, the, that uh, Sri was just talking about, mapping vulnerabilities, has to do with addressing bias in AI. I know you talked earlier about the importance of keeping a human in the loop. I, I'd like you to, to, to touch on that, but then also explain what is vulnerability intelligence? Definitely, that I got. Um, what I would say is, you know, again, you know, we don't want to purely look at machines. So you know, the way I say it, like, you know, if you take a bad code and automate it, right, you know, it becomes super bad, super fast, right? So you want to be very careful about, you know, how you actually, you know, look at this ML models or AI models, like, and see what they are doing, but also have the human, you know, interaction, always constantly look at it and say, what is the outcome that this model such is there a bias in it right ultimately it also is about what data we are feeding it right right so one is you know are we feeding the right data so that that model can actually make sense of it second is right you know is a model actually inferring something that is not what we are like right you know this is where research has come into play right you know we have boots on the ground we look at these cves cws cps and all of this relationship on a daily basis we look at it and say that don't look at this vulnerability from this only one angle, right? You know, we look at okay, this vulnerability can be chained with other ones, right? You know, and in in the industry that you know these two products are always there, right? A Microsoft Exchange is always going to be on a Microsoft Windows product, right? So can we look at you know, hey, is there a vulnerability on Microsoft Windows that a hacker can leverage or on a Microsoft Exchange vice versa, right? That kill chain is really, really important. So we look at all of that and bring that information right into the model so that the model can actually make sense. So it's that's what we call it as a human augmented, you know, intelligence, right? That gets into these models, right? And we are also able to look at it and say, you know, hey, is this what we are seeing in the real world? So we can actually treat, tell the model that, hey, this is wrong. So go back and adjust your, you know, your feature sets or, you know, take this as a feedback, right? So that's what, you know, we call it as human augmented, you know, intelligence and all of that. The second one is, you know, your question was about what is vulnerability intelligence, right? You know, my broad definition is, right, you know, vulnerability Intelligence is is aiming to provide organization with the insight and context right needed that is needed to you know sufficiently or effectively identify, prioritize and remediate vulnerabilities you know and the key is before they can be exploited by attackers. 
I talked about the scanners early on, right? And I was saying that scanners are great for identifying weaknesses, right? And they support the patch management activities. They do periodic scans, you know, they give you a lot of information about organization security posture, but they're often not, you know, you know, up to date, right? You know, they need time, you know, somebody has to write the plugin and all of it, right? This process of creating the plugin and updates is going to take sometimes, you know, several days to several weeks to sometimes and even months, right? You know, what that means is, right, you know, you have a gap that is left by this vulnerability scanner, and that's what the vulnerability intelligence is bridging it, right? It is the bridge between what is left by the scanners, you know, and what can we provide, right? You know, so that context of, you know, providing that information is what vulnerability intelligence um, is. Another right. aspect is, right, you know, again, we I touched on it just a bit, right, about, you know, looking at the le different lens from an industrial sector, right? Don't look at every threat in every industry the same. Look at, you know, CISA has the 16 industrial sectors, like right? whether this is, you know, um, manufacturing or healthcare, any of it, right? If you look at IoT devices, IoT devices have a very different attack surface and the threats in IoT devices are very different than medical devices, right? So you have to look and say that, you know, where is this device? What type of a sector it is? What are attackers are doing, right? So that's what vulnerability intelligence is about. Excellent. Well, last question for Sri, and that is about this joint partnership. The big question is, how are you going to measure success? How will you measure success with customers? What are the metrics that you're using and that they're going to be using to determine the value of this partnership? It's a great question, Rebecca. The first one is, you asked a, you asked a question from Kiran, what is vulnerability intelligence? You're required to report your material risk. You need insights. You need intelligence, right? That's a number one. Are we helping you get to your prioritization faster than what you were? It's a real measure, right? If you're taking 20 days to go through your data to report, and if I can do it in two minutes, that's a measurable outcome. Second, did I augment your talent shortage? You didn't have to go buy a hire a data scientist. You didn't have to go build your ML model. You didn't have to go hire another security expert. You didn't have to have somebody who just crunches all this data and reports on it. I gave you four headcount by bringing this. I solved your human talent gap. I augmented what you have. Second, I provided very clear technology risk. When people talk about, oh, there's a log4j issue, or there is the Citrix issue, or there is this SolarWinds issue, how do you know that's relevant to you? It's like COVID, right? You wouldn't know if you have COVID or not if you don't do your test. I'm helping you collect the global data, localizing it, and telling you if you have a problem or not. That's a lot of work. That's clearly on your tech stack. Number one, I'm providing a complete exposure outside and inside out. So the four key things companies are trying to do, and that's how we measure it. Mean time to detect, mean time to remediate, mean time to create resilience, and right? And you do it on a continual basis. So the promise really here is providing that platform, providing that solution for them to get super outcomes. That's how we measure success. That's number one. That's very measurable. The second one is, if we can save our customers from an agony of a breach, it's a win-win. That's our part. Number three, a patch prioritization. Now, not only helps our customers, but the entire ecosystem. We have more than 25 other very large security companies using our data. Now, it's not only helping us advance our products to our own customers, but it's helping this 25 security companies truly be in an advanced state and helping those. So the broader mission of we're going to fight the cyber war is now helping us take this to the entire ecosystem. Again, that's a big success as we keep adding security companies. So these are the three ways we measure the success. And of course, nothing trumps money, right? I mean, <laughs> so that's always there. But there's also the promise of secure everywhere work whether we do it or we do it through our partners, and that's a promise we are delivering. 
I like that tagline, saving customers from the agony of a breach. That's a, that you, sh you should use that in your marketing. That was, that was really good. Sri and Kieran, thank you so much for coming on the Cuba. Really fascinating conversation. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. Stay tuned for more of our coverage of Avanti and how they're working with partners to secure everywhere work. You're watching The Cube, the leader in enterprise technology coverage.